Professor Bokin, because you made reference to if we're even supposed to go by these statistics as I put out there, we should see a direct reflection of it in other areas of the economy, yeah. including revenue, yeah. internal revenue generation. Yeah. If you look at the GRA's own statistics, it, it hasn't grown that no. much no. as no. we see it. And they are still even struggling to identify and expand the, the tax net, as yeah. has always been the case. So, to the extent that the vice president has this data, mm -hmm. then we should be able to track how it's impacting the other areas as well. Because, because the problem, is the, eight, the the problem is the informality. Okay, but mm -hmm. to the extent that we are formalizing the, informa the informal sector, then we should be able to see how all these things are linked and overall helping us to grow. Because remember that we are talking about generating more tax revenue, but we are not growing a taxable economy. Mm -hmm. We are mm -hmm. not. It's just around 41 or so percent of the economy that is contributing almost 86 percent of the tax revenue. So the larger portion of the economy is actually not taxable. It's contributing just around 14 percent or so mm. to uh, to our tax revenue. So I think that um, I know that because because um, the economy is heavy, even in the U.S., yeah. you could see how the economy played out. Indeed. You could see how cost of living played out and all of that. Even though you could you could identify COVID, you could identify Russia, Ukraine, but they punished the Biden administration for, for what you were, the citizens were going through. So all over the world, you realize that, yes, we recognize external factors, but mm -hmm. voters can see nuances. Voters can see the difference between exogenous and endogenous factors. They can see that. So I think that, that, that's the issue. And in fact, if you look at the political manifestos mm -hmm. between the two main political parties, it's very heavy on job creation. True. They all recognize that we are sitting on a time bomb. Mm -hmm. Look, our population growth by 2040 our population will be 45 million. 58% of that population will be less than 30 years. So what that means is that we are, we are going to have more and more of our youth finishing free senior high school with less quality, entering the investors, entering the labor market, and we'll be looking for jobs that probably only exist in the textbook. When you see that statistics, even if you ask all of them to major in employment generation, they will end up being successfully unemployed. The economy must respond appropriately mm. that you cannot uh, run away from that and, and those jobs that are said to have been created must be verifiable yeah of course uh, not not in, no, 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 that's just a quick one it's a quick input well, then i'm just you, you know something i think one. that uh, we are inconsistent with this data and we need to be very clear here in 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 labor we have categories of you know employment mm -hmm. you have temporary work which you must properly itemize and let people know that this is a temporary work. It ends somewhere along the line. You have casual jobs, which ends somewhere along the line. You have contract of employment, which ends along the line. Then you have permanent jobs. Then you have people who are doing national service, which ends. Now, clearly, if you have employed people and you include that, Let's give you a typical example of uh, NAPCO people. If you are recording NAPCO people as people who are part of your data today, mm -hmm. you'll be misleading the country. Because NAPCO people are now unemployed. They are clearly not part and parcel of the data. You can, you can raise it up to a point. Temporary people. If you take the people who work in the some of the... Um, um, uh, let's say the hotels. Mm -hmm. Many of them work seasonally. And based upon uh, the seasonality of the job, you cannot, you can, you can record them as being employed as casuals, as temporary people for a period. The U.S. does the same thing. Mm -hmm. They clearly indicate that these are temporary jobs, these are casual jobs, these are contractual jobs. Because if you are constructing jobs uh, sorry, a, a road construction from here to the Jubilee House. And it will last for six months. Do I employ people for, for, for permanency? Certainly not. So let's clearly indicate what it is. So our data is actually mixed up with mm -hmm. all these things. So whatever we are teaching at the universities, and, and if you want to go with the data that we are all shouting on the rooftop about, 
we are actually misleading even the students. Well, if you talk That's about the, point. the inconsistency in the, in the reporting of the number of jobs created, you are not far from right. In fact, you are right because, let's put this on the screen right now. On the, 20th, on the 10th of April, 2023, 2023, 10th April, this was a report by the Daily Guide. Ecofado government has created 2.3 million jobs <laughs> in the last six years. This was as of 2023. It was a booking. <laughs> Let's flip to the next one. In 2020, specifically the 2nd of March 2020, the former Deputy Employment Minister also was reported to have said that NPP government has created 2.2 million jobs since 2017. This was mm -hmm. as of 2020, so maybe for th within a three-year or maybe four-year period, 2.2 as of 2020. Then let's flip to the next one. Then you have the employment minister <laughs> saying 5.3 million jobs have been created. Mm -hmm. This is as of 2022, September 16. So, Rosa Bokin, <laughs> whose report will you believe? Um, because employment generation, and even employment generation is different from just jobs. Yeah. You, you want to be very clear about it and all of that. You know, because it's such a big issue, given the youthful population, given the unemployment, and given inflation, and all of that. And look, I said it here that the crisis we've gone through mm -hmm. is, is a leveling up of crisis. It's a crisis of the middle class more because it has, affected, yeah, it has affected the middle class much more than even the core poor. Mm -hmm. Because if you look at our society, the middle class acts as a cushion. Mm -hmm. So I always say that the middle class is like Liverpool. Mm -hmm. they, don't, they never sleep alone. Mm -hmm. They don't wake up alone. There are so many people who make legitimate claims on your salary. So when, and if you look at the data from the World Bank, mm -hmm. lower middle income poverty, upper middle income poverty has been on the rise. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Much, much higher than even the poverty at 2.15 using the 2017 purchasing power parity terms, right? Mm -hmm. I see. Okay, so, so that is where we are. So I think that <coughs> politicians should also know and managers of the economy should know because, because it's a critical issue. Any data you put out there, people would want to check. Yeah. People would want to verify. So you have to go beyond just saying, we have created this. Or again, of course, the advisors and the technical advisors, the idea is that whatever you feed the vice president, with, whatever you feed government with, you have to make sure that you've done all these basic checks and all that so that you don't expose them. I think, I think that is all we should be looking at. But overall, I'm not, we, what we have celebrated in Ghana, in fact, in the last 20, 25 years, has been mainly jobless growth. Mm -hmm. Mainly jobless, jobless growth. growth. Look at the data. Nearly 20% of our GDP growth has come from mining and quarrying. Job creation hasn't happened in that area. Mm -hmm. If you look at retail, in fact, if you look at the service sector, that is a leading contributor to GDP growth. Mm -hmm. In the last couple of decades, you see wholesale and retail leading significantly. That sector is not job rich. In fact, wholesale and retail is also not contributing appropriately to tax revenue. Yeah. Its contribution to GDP is around just around 14 percent but the tax contribution is less than five percent mm. okay so when you are saying that grow a taxable economy yeah. you are looking at being deliberate beyond just broad-based fiscal monetary policies to spell growth you must be intentional you must be intentional about driving growth from the labor intensive subsectors of the economy because that is the only way you can make growth inclusive that's the only way you can make growth sustainable. <clears throat> Let me give you an example. I said it here. Between 2017, aided by oil and mining and quarrying, mm -hmm. uh, growth went to 8.1%. Between 2017 and 2019, Ghana was among the top six fast growing or fastest growing economies in South Saharan Africa. Mm -hmm. In fact, in 2019, the World Bank projection, including the IMF, said that Ghana's economy was going to be the fastest growing in the whole of South Southern Africa. But what do we see? Then COVID came. Mm -hmm. Because that growth didn't have resilience, COVID exposed us. Mm -hmm. And since then, our recovery has been much slower than the countries we benchmark ourselves with, even our regional peers, our structural peers, and our aspirational peers. Those below mm -hmm. us. Yes. 
are doing much better now. Then when you drill down like this cocoa story, look at Ghana's food inflation. You can never explain that. This, this is a country that is capable of feeding itself and the rest of our neighbors. If you check Ghana's food inflation, it's very high. Compare that to Cote d'Ivoire. Compare that to uh, Kenya and the rest of them. That's unacceptable. Mm. The, what we are doing, eh, and, and let's, let's be real, whoever wins next year's election, the, the, the conversation will not change. We're still going to be hard on government. Because of high food prices, inflation, and, and our consumption-based taxes, mm -hmm. the average Ghanaian is unable to save. True. From your disposable income, you are unable to save. You are spending between 42 to 44 percent of your in income, disposable income, on food, and food inflation has been very high. Mm -hmm. In fact, between 2021, latter part of 2021 to early part of 2024, food inflation on the average was more than 40 percent. In fact, in some regions in Ghana, food inflation was more than 70 percent. This was mm -hmm. food growing areas. The food yes. and northeast one. Yes, this is one of those areas. You gave works where you are skipping some meals. But if you have to eat how you have to eat <laughs> meals a day, then it's Charlie. way, way, way higher than that. If you are skipping, you are doing maybe uh, 101 or yeah. 001 or 010. That's where you come around the percentage you are giving. Yeah. But if you really want to go for a meal as a human being, the way you must eat, three square meal a day, then you, you start a main and dessert <laughs> exactly. for breakfast. You are, you are out of the roof completely. Look, mm -hmm. overall, this goes round and it rather affects the nation the more. Any country that is not saving, you are not accumulating capital. And therefore, to even take advantage of the limited economic opportunities, you don't have the capital. Your capital formation is low. Mm -hmm. So you have to rely on, a, on foreign capital, okay, by revising your rules to make it more attractive. Because capital will only go to where it feels loved. Then this is the game. If you look at the data over a period, we are supplying labor. The growth generation, growth is only generated here, but growth is not resident here. Mm -hmm. We pound enough for food for others to go and eat. Yeah. And that is why you see positive growth, you see trade uh, balance being positive, mm -hmm. and yet the city is depreciating. Depreciate. We don't own this economy. Yeah. We are not investing in this economy. You, if you ask all of us here to put 50000 on the table mm -hmm. as a venture a partnership, with a, I can't raise it. I'll go to a prayer camp. I can't raise it. I can't raise it. So this is what is happening. Because we are supplying the labor, return on labor is very low. And, but return on capital is very high. And return on capital is going to foreigners. So you see that trade surplus is positive. Mm -hmm. the theoretically, if you contribute to the strengthening of the local currency, you are not seeing that. But then when you come to the services and income account, you see a huge outflow which is a reflection of the low local content of your economy. We don't own this economy. We are not. All the critical sectors of this economy, uh, uh, higher growth, income, rich sectors of the economy, Ghana is absent. Mm -hmm. Take the banking sector. What is the local ownership in the banking sector? Mm -hmm. Take mm -hmm. insurance. Mm -hmm. Take mining. And if take I, oil it, and gas. The banking what sector. makes this economy Ghanaian? What is national about this national cake we are talking about? There's nothing national and, about and, and, it. And, and we, 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 we had a, we had a lot of the Ghanaian-owned banks actually being mm. closed as yeah. well, yes. affected yeah. by this uh, <coughs> uh, financial sector. Mm. And in fact, even the DDP has further impacted on yeah. a number of the Ghanaian-owned financial institutions that I, I am aware of. Yeah. And 